The gusher unleashed in the Gulf of Mexico continues to spew crude oil. There are no reliable estimates of how much oil is pouring into the Gulf, but it comes to many millions of gallons since the catastrophic blowout. Eleven men were killed in the explosions that sank one of the most sophisticated drilling rigs in the world, the Deepwater Horizon. This week, Congress continues its investigation, but Congress has not heard from the man you are about to meet. Mike Williams was one of the last crew members to escape the inferno. He says the destruction of the Deepwater Horizon had been building for weeks in a series of mishaps. The night of the disaster, he was in his workshop when he heard the rig's engines suddenly run wild. That was the moment that explosive gas was shooting across the decks, being sucked into the engines that powered the rig's generators. I hear the engines revving. The lights are, are glowing. I'm hearing the alarms. I mean, they're, they're at a constant state now. It's just beep, 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 and it doesn't stop. But even that's starting to get drowned out by the sound of the engine increasing in speed. And my lights get so incredibly bright that they, they physically explode. Um, I'm, I'm pushing my way back from the desk when my computer monitor exploded. This is the Deepwater Horizon in the hours before its destruction, the night of April 20th. Ironically, the end was coming only months after the rig's greatest achievement. Mike Williams was the chief electronics technician in charge of the rig's computers and electrical systems, and seven months before, he'd helped the crew drill the deepest oil well in history, 35,000 feet. It was special. Uh, there's no way around it. Everyone was talking about it. The congratulations that were flowing around, it just it made you feel proud to work there. Williams worked for the owner, Transocean, the largest offshore drilling company. Like its sister rigs, the Deepwater Horizon cost $350 million, rose 378 feet from bottom to top. Both advanced and safe, none of her 126 crew had been seriously injured in seven years. The safety record was remarkable because offshore drilling today pushes technology with challenges matched only by the space program. Deepwater Horizon was in 5,000 feet of water and would drill another 13,000 feet, a total of three and a half miles. The oil and gas down there are under enormous pressure, and the key to keeping that pressure under control is this fluid that drillers call mud. Mud is a man-made drilling fluid that's pumped down the well and back up the sides in continuous circulation. The sheer weight of this fluid keeps the oil and gas down and the well under control. Come on, come on. The tension in every drilling operation is between doing things safely and doing them fast. Time is money, and this job was costing VP a million dollars a day. But Williams says there was trouble from the start. Getting to the oil was taking too long. How long did you expect it to take? We were told 21 days. How long did it actually take? Uh, we were at six weeks. With the schedule slipping, Williams says a BP manager ordered a faster pace. And he requested to, to the driller, hey, let's bump it up, let's bump it up. And what he was talking about there is he's, he's bumping up the rate of penetration, how fast the drill bit is going down. Williams says going faster caused the bottom of the well to split open swallowing tools and the drilling fluid called mud. We actually got stuck. And we got stuck so bad that we had to send tools down into the drill pipe and sever the pipe. That well was abandoned. Deepwater Horizon had to drill a new route to the oil. It cost BP more than two weeks and millions of dollars. We were informed of this during one of the safety meetings that somewhere in the neighborhood of $25 million was lost in bottom hole assembly in mud. And you always kind of knew that in the back of your mind when they start throwing these big numbers around that th there was going to be a push coming, you know, a push to, to, to pick up production, pick up the pace. There was pressure on the crew after this happened? There's always pressure, but yes, the pressure was increased. But the trouble was just beginning. When drilling resumed, Williams says there was an accident on the rig that has not been reported before. He says four weeks before the explosion, the rig's most vital piece of safety equipment was damaged. Down near the seabed is the blowout preventer, or BOP. 
It's used to seal the well shut. In order to test the pressure and integrity of the well, and in case of a blowout, it's the crew's only hope. A key component is a rubber gasket at the top called an annular, which can close tightly around the drill pipe. Williams says that during a test, they closed the gasket, but while it was shut tight, a crewman on deck accidentally nudged a joystick, applying hundreds of thousands of pounds of force and moving 15 feet of drill pipe through the closed blowout preventer. Later, a man monitoring drilling fluid rising to the top made a troubling find. They discovered chunks of rubber in, this, in the drilling fluid. He thought it was important enough to gather this double handful of chunks of rubber and bring them into the driller shack. I recall asking the, the supervisor if this was out of the ordinary. He saw it and it's just, it's no big deal. And I thought, how, how can it be not a big deal? There's, there's chunks of our seal that's now missing. And William says he knew about another problem with the blowout preventer. The BOP is operated from the surface by wires connected to two control pods. One is a backup. William says that one of the pods lost some of its function weeks before. Transocean tells us the BOP was tested by remote control after these incidents and passed. But nearly a mile below, there was no way to know how much damage there was or why the pod seemed unreliable. In the hours before the disaster, Deepwater Horizon's work was nearly done. All that was left was to seal the well closed. The oil would be pumped out by another rig later. Williams says that during a safety meeting, the manager for the rig owner, Transocean, was explaining how they were going to close the well when the manager from BP interrupted. I had the, the BP company man sitting directly beside me and he he literally perked up and said well my my process is different and I think we're gonna do it this way and they, they kind of lined out the way he thought it should go that day so there was sort of a, a chest bumping kind of deal the communication seemed to really break down as to who was ultimately in charge the day of the accident BP flew several managers to the Deepwater Horizon for a ceremony to congratulate the crew for seven years without an injury. While they were there, a surge of explosive gas came flying up the well from three miles below. The rig's diesel engines, which power its electric generators, sucked in the gas and began to run wild. I'm hearing hissing, engines are over revving, and then all of a sudden all the lights in my shop just started getting brighter and brighter and brighter. And I knew, I knew then we were, something bad was getting ready to happen. It was almost 10 at night, and directly under the deep water horizon were four men in a fishing boat. Albert Andre, Dustin King, Ryan Chasen, and Wesley Borg. When I heard the gas coming out, I knew exactly what it was almost immediately. When the gas cloud was descending on you, what was that like? It was, it was scary. And when I looked at it, it burned my eyes. And I, I, I knew I, we had to get out of there. You could tell what it was. I knew it was methane. On the rig, Mike Williams was reaching for a door to investigate the engine noise. These are three inch thick steel fire rated doors with six stainless steel hinges supporting them on the frame. As I reached for the handle, I heard this awful hissing noise, this whoosh, And at the height of the hiss, a huge explosion. The explosion literally rips the door from the hinges. Hits, impacts me and takes me to the other side of the shop. And I'm up against the wall when I finally come around with a door on top of me. And I remember thinking to myself, you know, this, this is it. I'm gonna die right here. The men on the fishing boat had a camera. Look at the water on fire. I began to, to crawl across the floor. As I got to the next door, it exploded and took me, the door, and slid me about 35 feet backwards again and planted me up against another wall. At that point, I actually got angry. I was mad at the doors. I was mad that these, these fire doors that are supposed to protect me are hurting me. And at that point, I, I made a decision. I'm going to get outside. 
I may die out there, but I'm going to get outside. So I crawl across the grid work of the floor and make my way to that opening where I see the light. I made it out the door, and I thought to myself, I've, I've accomplished what I set out to accomplish. I made it outside. At least now I can breathe. I may die out here, but I can breathe. Williams couldn't see. Something was pouring into his eyes, and that's when he noticed a gash on his forehead. I didn't know if it was blood. I didn't know if it was brains. I didn't know if it was flesh. I, I didn't know what it was. I just knew there was, I was, I was in trouble. At that point, I grabbed a life jacket. Um, I was on the aft lifeboat deck. There were two functioning lifeboats at my disposal right there. But I knew I couldn't board them. Uh, I had responsibilities. His responsibility was to report to the bridge, the rig's command center. I'm hearing alarms. I'm hearing radio chatter, mayday, mayday, mayday. We've lost propulsion. We've lost power. We have a fire. Man overboard on the starboard forward deck. Williams says that on the bridge, he watched them try to activate emergency systems. The BOP that was supposed to protect us and keep us from the blowout obviously had failed, and now the emergency disconnect to get us away from this fuel source has failed. We have no communications to the BOP. <laughs> I see one of the lifeboats in the water and it's motoring away from the vessel. I looked at the captain and asked him, I said, what's going on? He said, I've given the order to abandon ship. Every Sunday they had practice lifeboat drills and the procedure for making sure that everyone was accounted for. But in the panic, all that went to hell. The lifeboats were leaving. They're leaving without you? They have left without the captain and without knowing that they had everyone that had survived all this on board. I've been left now by two lifeboats. And I look at the captain, I said, what do we do now? By now, the fire is not only on the derrick, it's starting to spread to the deck. At that point, there were several more explosions, large, intense explosions. What do they feel like, sound like? Uh, it just take your breath away type explosions, shake your body to the core explosions. Um, take your vision away from the percussion of the explosions. About eight survivors were left on the rig. They dropped an inflatable raft from a crane, but with only a few of the survivors on the raft, it was launched, leaving Williams, another man, and a crew woman named Andrea. I remember looking to, at, at Andrea and seeing that, that look in her eyes of, she had quit, she had given up. I remember her saying, I'm scared. And I said, it's okay to be scared, I'm scared too. He said, what are we going to do? I said, we're going to burn up or we're going to jump. How far is it to the sea? Maybe 90 feet, 100 feet. Uh, it's, it's a long ways. In the middle of the night, with blood in his eyes, fire at his back, and the sea 10 stories below, Williams made his choice. I remember closing my eyes and, and saying a prayer. and. Uh, <clears throat> asking God to tell my wife and little girl that uh, Daddy did everything he could. And, and if I survive this, it's for a reason. I made those three steps and I pushed off into the rig. And I fell for what seemed like forever. A lot of things go through your mind. the rest of Mike Williams' story and a look at the company responsible for the disaster when we come back. Eight barriers were breached. Well, integrity was not established or failed. One annulus cement barrier did not isolate hydrocarbons. Two shoot track barriers did not isolate hydrocarbons. Hydrocarbons entered the well undetected and well control was lost. Three negative pressure tests was accepted although well integrity had not been established. Four influx was not recognized until hydrocarbons were in riser. Five well control response actions failed to regain control of well. 
hydrocarbons ignited on the Deepwater Horizon 6 diversion to mud gas separator resulted in gas venting onto rig 7 fire and gas system did not prevent hydrocarbon ignition blowout prevented did not seal the well 8 blowout prevent bot emergency mode did not seal well Well, integrity was not established or failed. Production casing installation. After drilling to total depth, casing is run to bottom in preparation for the cement job. A double valve float collar is used to prevent backflow or ingress of fluids through the chute track until the cement hardens and creates a permanent barrier. April 18, 030 April 19, 1930 Long string design robust consistent with similar wells in the area. Nine attempts made to establish circulation to convert float valves. Circulate approximately six times open hole volume. Limited circulation due to concerns over creating losses and hole washout. No evidence that hydrocarbons entered the wellbore prior to the cementing operation. Cement is pumped down casing through the float collar and up the annulus to isolate the primary reservoir sands. April 19, 1930 April 20, 7 o'clock. Nitrogen cement slurry chosen. To achieve lightweight slurry due to limited pore pressure, fracture gradient window. Possible risk. Stability of foam. Relatively small volume. Susceptible to contamination. Mitigation of risk by thorough testing of slurry design. Precise placement. Centralization 6 in line centralizers spaced across the reservoir sands. Additional centralizers not run because incorrectly thought to be wrong type. Risk of channeling above reservoir sands known and accepted. Key finding number one, the annulus cement barrier did not isolate the reservoir hydrocarbons. Foam slurry recommended was a complex design. Risk of contamination using small volume of cement. No fluid loss additives. Incomplete pre-job cement lab testing. Foam slurry was likely unstable and resulted in nitrogen breakout. Cement slurry design issues. An independent lab completed over 500 tests on a representative cement slurry and reported the following, 50% quality foam its surface conditions was not stable. 18.5% quality foam, downhole quality, was not stable. Yield point of the Halliburton slurry was too low for the foam cement, 2 pounds 100 feet, yield point at 135 degaf. Fluid loss for the base slurry was excessive compared to industry. Recommendations 302 cc versus 50 cc per 30 minutes. Flow through shoot track, supporting evidence. Key finding number two, the chute track mechanical barriers did not isolate the hydrocarbons. 
tail cement is displaced down the casing into the chute track. The tail cement is designed to prevent flow from the annulus into the casing. The float collar valves, which provide a second barrier, must close and seal to prevent flow up the casing. Chute track had two types of mechanical barriers. Cement in the chute track and the double check valves in the float collar chute track cement failed to act as a barrier due to contamination of the base slurry by breakout of nitrogen from the foam. Slurry. Hydrocarbon influx was able to bypass the float collar check valves due to either valves failed to convert or valves failed to seal. Flow through shoe confirmed by fluid modeling and Macondo static kill data. Hydrocarbons entered the well undetected and well control was lost. Casing positive pressure test. A positive pressure test verifies the integrity of the casing and seal assembly. April 20, 7 o'clock to 12 o'clock. Casing was a pressure tested to 250 psi, low, 2700 psi, high. Test successful. Proved integrity of blind shear rams, seal assembly, casing, and wiper plug. Test does not test the shoot track due to presence of wiper plug. Negative pressure test. The negative pressure test checks the integrity of the chute track casing and wellhead seal assembly. This simulates conditions during temporary abandonment when a portion of the well is displaced to sea water. April 20, 1504 to 1955. Negative test simulates underbalanced condition. Space are used between mud and sea water. Leaking annular at start of test moved spacer across kill line inlet. Negative test started on drill pipe but changed to kill line. Bleed volumes higher than calculated. Drill pipe built pressure to 1400 psi with no flow on the kill line. to 1835. Drill pipe pressure gradually increased to 1,400 psi. 1842. Pumped into kill line to confirm full kill line opened for monitoring negative test. 1842 to 1955. Monitored kill line for 30 minutes 1,400 psi on drill pipe described as a bladder effect. 1955. Negative pressure test was concluded and considered a good test. Key finding number 3. The negative pressure test was accepted although well integrity had not been established. Bleed volumes not recognized as a problem. Anomalous pressure on drill pipe with no flow from kill line. Testing correctly accepted as successful. Negative testing not standardized. Well monitoring, drillers console and mud logging unit. Well monitoring is performed to understand if the well has losses or gains. Driller is responsible for monitoring and shutting in the well. The mud logger provides monitoring support to the driller, displays and trending capability available in both drillers and mud loggers cabins flow, pressure and pit sensors can indicate flow. Simultaneous activities were taking place on April 20 to prepare for rig move. Standards for monitoring do not specifically address end of well activities. Undetected flowing conditions. 
Mud in the riser is displaced with seawater in preparation for temporary abandonment. April 20, 1955 to 21, 14, 2002. Resume displacement of mud with seawater. 2052 well becomes underbalanced and starts to flow. After 2058 gain being taken and pressure begins increasing. Flow from well masked by emptying of trip tank. 2108 pumping stops for sheen test. Pressure increases with pump off. 2114 sheen test complete. Displacement resumes. Key finding number four. The influx was not recognized until hydrocarbons were in the riser. Flow indications. Number one, drill pie pressure increased by 100 psi, expected decreased. Approximately 39 barrels gained from 2058 to 2108. Flow indications. Number one, drill pie pressure increased by 100 psi, expected decreased. Approximately 39 barrels gained from 2058 to 2108. Number two, drill pipe pressure increased by 246 psi with pumps off. Flow out does not immediately drop after shutting down pump. Flow indications. Number one, drill pie pressure increased by 100 psi, expected decreased. Approximately 39 barrels gain from 2058 to 2108. Number two, drill pipe pressure increased by 246 psi with pumps off. Flow out does not immediately drop after shutting down pump. Number 3, drill pie pressure increased by 556 psi with pumps off, approximately 300 barrels gain. No well control actions taken. Key finding number 5, well control response actions failed to regain control of the well. Diverting to the mud gas separator at about 21.42. When responding to a well control event the riser diverter is closed and fluid sent to either the mud gas separator or to the overboard diverter lines. Rig crew has the option to divert flow to port, starboard overboard lines or the mud gas separator. Diverting to port or starboard will result in fluid venting overboard. Liquid outlet from mud gas separator goes to the mud system under the main deck. Gas flow to surface at high rate 2146 to 2200. When responding to a well control event the riser diverter is closed and fluid sent to either the mud gas separator or to the overboard diverter lines. Instantaneous gas rates reached 165 mms CFD. Pressures exceeded operating ratings above 100 psi. Gas would probably have vented from slip joint packer into the moon pool 12 mud gas separator goose neck vent 6 mud gas separator vacuum breaker vent 6 overboard line through burst disc 10 mud line under the main deck. As dispersion across the deep water horizon 2146 to 2150 hours. Secondary protective systems did not prevent ignition. 
Secondary protective systems gas cloud reached the supply air intakes for engine rooms 3, 4, 5 and 6. The fire and gas system did not automatically trigger a shutdown of the HVAC system for the engine rooms. Limited areas of the rig are designated as electrically classified zones. Key finding number 6. Diversion to the mud gas separator resulted in gas venting onto the rig. Hydrocarbons were routed to the mud gas separator instead of diverting overboard. Resulted in rapid gas dispersion across the rig through the MGS vents and mud system. Key finding number 7. The fire and gas system did not prevent hydrocarbon ignition. Emergency well control system did not seal the well. Blowout preventer response before the explosions. BOP is designed to seal the well bore and shear casing or drill pipe if necessary. April 20, 2141 annular blowout preventer closed but appears not to have sealed the annulus. 2147 a variable pipe ram likely closed and sealed the annulus. Blowout preventer response impact of explosions. Blowout preventer response after the explosions. There are several emergency methods of activating the blind shear ram to seal the well. Key finding number 8. The blowout preventer emergency mode did not seal the well. this bell icon so you never miss any new updates cause whenever we upload new video you will get a notification on your phone